All right, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is James English, and I'm happy to be here with Peter Brantley from UC Davis Libraries. And today we're gonna be talking about the, uh, an update on a project that we're working together along with some other university libraries. Um, it's called Palace Project, but it's for academic use cases. And the particular uh, topic we're gonna talk about is uh, using par our partnerships to kind of demystify the complexity of getting ebook access uh, or better ebook access into uh, libraries for academic materials. So just a little bit of a note for those that may not bef uh, be familiar with who Lyricist is. Lyricist is a nonprofit organization that services archives, museums, uh, libraries uh, for digital content, digital content management solutions, open source community uh, programs and projects, as well as other type of services that we do uh, that are more in the traditional consortial base around training and, and materials as such. Uh, we are a global organization. We're in all 50 uh, states, uh, 20 different countries, and five different continents. So we have a, a wide reach uh, and a wide area of operation. Uh, for the Palace Project in particular, we've had a lot of great success. It's primarily been focused on the public library space where the project and the technology was born. Uh, we're in over 100, uh, 450 active uh, libraries with the Palace Project in over 18 states and one territory, American Samoa, uh, to provide the ebook access to users of ebooks from libraries. And we're also very excited working with our three academic uh, library partners uh, to make Palace available and explore its use in the academic setting. Ah, and I skipped over. So what is the Palace Project? I keep saying that name. It is really at its simplest an e-reading app. It's a mobile e-reading app, but it's very different than what you would traditionally kind of probably use in your day-to-day e-reading -day e activities on a mobile device. Uh, you're probably used to uh, tools like Libby or Hoopla, uh, probably from your, uh, or maybe something like Amazon Prime or Kindle or Google Play Books. Um, this is different in that it is solely for the use by public libraries. Some of those that I mentioned are for use by libraries, but again, we differentiate ourselves in that we are not a conduit for selling you content. Uh, we are a conduit for the content that you have acquired as a public library that you wanna make available to your users. And we don't even differentiate between whether it's content you acquired through some type of commercial process. It could be your digitized works, open access material, public domain material. And the, the goal is to make any of that material available, regardless of what its license status or commercial value is. That uh, value is actually determined by the library who added that material into the collection. So it's really simple. We just try to simplify that access for your users so they don't have to learn the myriad of the tools that libraries are forced to kind of present to patrons and users in order to access their ebook collections or other digital content. Uh, it integrates all of that different content because it is at its back end an integration layer. Um, there's really kind of two methods we can do that. So you can think all the way back to where the co uh, content is actually published. We have the ability to work with publishers to get that material, host that material, and then make that available. We also can work directly with the different content repositories out there, whether they be a commercial provider, an aggregator of eBooks, to an institutional repository or to some of these national or global repositories like uh, OAPEN or Knowledge Unlatched that are making uh, open access materials uh, available at scale globally. And we try to do all of that, uh, keeping in principle with uh, this concept of open uh, standards, open interoperability as a, uh, a founding principle of how we build and manage the technology. And that is, that piece of it is what we're gonna talk about today uh, with my colleague, uh, Peter Brantley, who's actually been involved in this for probably a decade <laughs> longer than I have been uh, with the same uh, technology, helping to uh, develop it and introduce it into the ebook and library space. So who can benefit from Palace? Well, any type of library, really. Uh, as we look at this, we can see where it was born in public libraries, but we also see that there's uh, ability to use this at the state library levels, corporate libraries, special use libraries, um, some of those public domain and open access uh, repositories, but also it could be uh, libraries dedicated for a specific type of user, whether that's like a Bookshare or NLS type library. Um, and then your state uh, 
uh, libraries that may be buying and acquiring content to make uh, available not only to public libraries in their state or territory, but also making it available to K, to, uh, K through 12 or higher ed libraries uh, at, at large across the state. So how are we gonna do this in academics? Well, we have to partner because we are a community-led organization and as such, we run our projects through the community to kind of lead us and guide us in our efforts in these areas, especially around technology and the application of technology in the different institutions. So uh, we've been working with uh, some really great partners that represent a, a spectrum uh, within the, the academic library and higher ed library market that approach ebooks uh, and are leaders in ebooks in their, in their respective rights, but they do it in different ways. And so this would give us an ability to understand how we can serve not just one particular type of institutions, but be applicable to any type of higher ed institution. Uh, part of that process is also working with content aggregators, content publishers, and providers of ebooks. And over the last year, this has primarily been done uh, in Palos with a, a great partnership with ProQuest, uh, especially around the use of open standards to make this uh, content available. And that's a, a great part to our partners at NYU who made that possible with ProQuest. Uh, I am going to hand it from uh, over real quick to one of our uh, latest partners, uh, the University of California, uh, and Peter's going to talk about their efforts and how they're approaching this project with us. So I'm going to click, and I think your slide is up. Awesome, thank you. And thanks everybody for coming. Um, so I wanted to uh, just do a mini deck and share with you some of the experiences that we've had to date. Uh, it's very early for the University of California, but we've been very excited to partner with Lyricists on this. And uh, in many ways, as I go through this uh, short deck of slides, you'll see that we're reprising many of the same challenge points that libraries have uh, when it comes to automating our feature features in almost every other area. not my laptop. <clears throat> so um, the overriding uh, motivation, of course, is that we feel like higher ed deserves a better ebook experience for our patrons. Finding and reading ebooks on the myriad of platforms that are out there can be really frustrating. And obviously with each of those platforms, we often are confronting a different user experience. And also not just for uh, students who are trying to acquire a better understanding of their materials, but uh, these um, multitude of UXs also creates research uncertainty, trying to figure out what content exists in what platform and what silo, and then retrieving that and working with that content can be very frustrating. And um, you know, often as we're seeing our campuses move to mobile, we're also discovering that a lot of the ebook platforms that exist out there really were designed for a web desktop experience. And so the mobile experience is a, a poor cousin um, to many of those. And it's really important strategically that we keep in mind that we need to support both types of platforms, both portable, mobile, uh, as well as uh, traditional desktop-based research activities and reading activities. And you know, I think one of the concerns that we share with uh, Lyricists and many of our other partners is that today readers haven't really been a strong part of this conversation. Um, you know, we, we librarians and we platform providers have talked in between ourselves about what kinds of functionality we think our community needs, but those, of, uh, those who are actually consuming the content have oftentimes been left out. So we really at the University of California and I think our peer partners as well, um, you know, we're really seeking a single user experience for as many um, UC licensed and available eBooks as possible. Uh, so this would include open access or, or more generally what are called free to read books, um, plus licensed uh, commercial content or provided through platform providers that we've gained uh, access to uh, their uh, their corpora through. Um, we're seeking a modern reading experience across most of the devices that we work with on a day-to-day -day basis. And uh, this is a, a point of challenge, but we're increasingly trying to remove barriers to access to that content for our users and getting closer to a, a one-click access point of access uh, whenever we can. 
at the same time, as libraries, we're also very interested in policy controls that protect the privacy of our users, protect um, the information that they're accessing, safeguarding that, and ensuring that that's not widely available. Uh, and, in, and I think importantly and, and increasingly, we're, we're aware that user experiences for uh, ebook content uh, and other similar materials have to be ADA compliant. And uh, that's something that uh, has been on people's minds for a long time, but uh, I think with newer web standards, obtaining results here is a little bit easier. So when UC discovered that uh, some of our partners on the East Coast, and particularly NYU and Columbia, were already starting to explore some of the advantages of adopting um, the Palace Project or its predecessors, Simply E and Library Simplified, that emerged out of NYPL, where oddly James and I first worked together uh, and met each other. Um, at the University of California, we saw an opportunity to, pal to partner uh, in, a, in that broader community to figure out what Palace support would mean for us. Um, and so, like them, we're interested in negotiating with platforms that are providing content across our community. And we're hoping that um, you know, through our engagement as a consortia, uh, as well as the individual institutions of uh, Columbia and NYU, um, we can uh, provide input into Lyricist for the Palace Project and uh, further the scope of their development so that uh, a broader range of institutions can be supported. And you know, I think ultimately behind this, we shouldn't lose a sight of the fact that by making access and the reading experience easier, it's more fun, right? And, and there is always that element of, of research and learning should be as fun as we can make it. Um, and this is one small avenue toward that. So at UC, we've convened a, a working group to uh, march us through the process of exploring uh, the many attributes of Palace and how we would integrate it in our consortial environment uh, and into our various aspects of acquisition and deployment. Uh, so I'm not going to iterate people's names here, but you'll see that we are trying to draw across the system. Um, so there's strong representation from a couple campuses, but this is definitely a UC project. There's a, a lot of uh, skepticism, I think, in, inherent in a university environment for uh, fostering a mobile reading experience, which has so often been associated primarily with public libraries and uh, in many ways with consumer content and not uh, professional research content. And you know, I, those of us who are maintaining access systems can see the user counts marching up on mobile and we feel like it's important to be able to uh, deliver that kind of experience as ubiquitously as possible. Um, and at the same time, it's also incumbent on us to be part of this conversation with lyricists and other institutions so that we can all sort of march together and wind up with a common uh, solution set rather than winding up in a world where we have siloed reading experiences that are duplicated on a mobile just as they are in a uh, desktop environment. We're also at UC the beneficiaries of a project uh, that's funded by the Mellon Foundation called Project Lind, um, who's one of whose PIs I see in the audience, Rice Majors, uh, who's an AOL at Davis. And Project Lind is an investigation of the forms of digital lending that, um, that uh, the university might be able to undertake in the future with a broad range of potentially transformative use cases uh, that might be under purview. Um, and because Palace has a lot of depth to it as an architecture, uh, it's certainly one of those things that the technical work group of that project is considering as we move forward in that investigation as well. At UC, uh, we have a multiple phase project, as you would expect, uh, as any good library would, uh, and we are uh, culminating the first phase of our work, which is uh, delivering a, a, a preliminary report on the feasibility of adopting uh, palace in the UC context, um, which goes through March, and we're working on uh, the report this month. So the headaches. Well, as I mentioned, nothing is new here. So we're uh, experiencing issues uh, integrating with platforms, with acquisitions, with catalog integration, authentication, which we have at least 10 of and maybe more, uh, discovery and access, um, and of course, um, 
training and access. And, and there I would uh, nod more to uh, Columbia and NYU who are um, a little bit ahead of us and already undertaking some of those efforts. Uh, so if they're here, maybe they'll participate uh, if you have questions about that. So first of all, platforms. Um, so a lot of the platforms out there that are providing ebooks are not fully ready by our understanding uh, to participate in a world of palace. And uh, partly that's because uh, platforms often generate only PDFs, um, and mobile reading and adaptive reading and accessible reading all benefit from the use of EPUBs. Um, some providers can and provide EPUBs and some cannot, or some are working towards it. But this is something that we really want to encourage. Other pub, uh, platforms are highly reliant on streaming content through a browser. Uh, so this is, uh, you know, technically, uh, you know, often JavaScript that's taking pieces of content and then pushing it into a user agent on a, on a desktop. Uh, this does not work well in the Palace model, which is reliant on a package of content moving from one machine to another machine and being processed there. Um, and it's important for us to be able to provide uh, certainly both modalities at the very least. Um, sort of a, a subset of that or a, a similar to that kind of problem, uh, some platform providers only, public, only provide content to their uh, communities on a segment based, a chapter, um, a section of a book, and so forth. So this is better than nothing, but again, it really sort of cuts up the reading or acquisition experience for the reader or the researcher, and it's very frustrating for us to work with technically. Different authentica authentication expectations. I, I think most of this community is um, well into supporting SAML-based access, um, uh, but there are still some platform providers that uh, trust IP-based authentication uh, first or only, and obviously that that's a problem when you're trying to create a federated service. Uh, so we really need to, uh, to see um, uniform support for federated uh, identity management. Um, at the same time, uh, we're very cognizant that uh, browser manufacturers are rapidly moving away from the support of technologies such as cookies and iframes that support um, a lot of the technologies that we're using, Shibboleth, uh, SAML-based authentication mechanisms. And so we are watching very carefully some of the new technologies that are emerging from the browser manufacturers, um, uh, generally centered around what's known as uh, federated certificate management. Uh, there's a talk later today uh, that involves Ken Klingenstein, and he'll speak to some of this shift. Uh, this is an incredibly important transformation in how we authenticate against accessed uh, material. So uh, something that everybody should be paying attention to. Um, a lot of platforms don't support direct content access. If you do a query um, and obtain a result on the platform, uh, you get an info page about that content, which is great maybe if you're uh, thinking with a librarian hat and you want to see all the metadata around a piece of content. Not so good if you're actually trying to read the material. Uh, or, or to retrieve the material and put it into a reading environment. So again, we're having to work with platforms to have, help them better understand that we need pointers that, point, that reference that content directly so that we can retrieve that content and bring it into another user experience. And then finally, James will talk a little bit more about this, but we utilize a, a web native stack uh, very lightweight stack for publishing uh, the information of available material and the terms under which it can be accessed called the Open Publication Distribution System. And this is new to a lot of publishers, and so we often have conversations with them about how to generate OPDS catalogs. Like any good standard, we've gone through a couple of iterations, but there's a lot of coherence around the, the most recent version of OPDS, and uh, I think it's a, a very quite mature enough standard for uh, platforms to su provide support for. Acquisitions. Um, so uh, when thinking with a UC hat on, uh, working with Palace has really underscored uh, the incoherence of our content acquisition and cataloging uh, strategies. Um, there's inevitably going to be, in a large university research environment, um, a little bit of a mismatch between what we understand we have access to and what the platform thinks we have access to. And that 
works in both directions. Sometimes we actually have more access to things than we thought we did. Uh, sometimes uh, we have less. Um, and as we worked with OPDS catalogs and other discovery mechanisms, some of that uh, fuzziness becomes more apparent. Um, interestingly, too, we've uh, been learning that uh, as institutions, we might have access to certain types of content through our subscriptions that uh, we just need to calve off. Uh, so maybe we actually have access to a wonderful collection of high school materials on geography, but we're not utilizing those in our pedagogy, um, or we use alternative intro methods uh, to gain some literacy in those domains. So we might exclude those uh, from uh, visibility in an application like Palace. UC has this additional complication. Because we are 10 campuses, we, we have this tiered acquisitions model where we try to acquire material try to license material across the entire system whenever possible, but there may be large subsets of campuses that want their own subscription that other campuses don't also uh, adhere to. So a, a poster child for this would be all campuses with medical schools or all campuses with law schools. Um, and then there are, there's a, a further delineation of content that's only accessed by a single institution. Um, or one or, or two institutions. Uh, so a poster child for this might be Davis, which has a veterinary school. So there may be uh, content that we subscribe to, both journal or ebook collections that other campuses wouldn't. This horrendously complicates how we uh, develop our own palace experience. Um, it's all surmountable, but it, uh, there may be situations where there are small in cases of uh, licensed material um, that we just can't provide strict authenticated access to. Uh, so if, if there's a, a special set of five books that only law faculty at uh, Irvine get access to, might not be able to get to you right off the bat as we implement Palace. Catalog integration. I know nothing about cataloging. So um, all I know is that this is really hard under the best of circumstances. And we are an ex libris alma primo um, uh, consortial campus. Um, and so the various vagaries of things that get cataloged in institution-based ALMA instances versus the institution-wide ALMA instance versus the Primo discovery interface makes my head hurt even looking at it. And there's just simply no good workflow in place uh, that's common across all content providers. And as we start to think about how to provide direct access through Palace for ebook acquisition and similar acquisitions, um, we have to think about where are we in providing the indexed access mechanism. Is that in Primo? Is that in a separate web page? Where does that get um, highlighted for the user? So there are some really significant questions there. Authentication, I mentioned this already. UC is 10 campuses plus, we have the University Office of the President, um, Agriculture and Natural Resources, we have agreements with labs, DOE labs, um, and we have no single comprehensive authentication system. Why would we? Um, so for now, in, in hard cases where we all have common uh, HR systems, for example, we use simple SAML to redirect to uh, each instance campus of campus authentication. Um, but as I mentioned, this is under some technology uh, this, is, this has a technology threat horizon, and so you know we all have to be cognizant of keeping track with that as that moves forward. Uh, discovery and access. Palace is mobile-based. That's where it came from. That's its, its heritage for now. Uh, there's a significant amount of interest in moving Palace uh, into support for uh, a browser-based uh, content consumption as well, and there's some early uh, experiments and early prototypes for how to do that with uh, open source code, and so watch that space. Um, on the flip side, ebook discovery, uh, for the platforms at least, is heavily uh, biased toward web-based discovery, um, and again, part of the work that we're partnering with our colleagues at other institutions and with Lyricis on is trying to figure out a better way to do that on a mobile interface. Um, and, and, you know, we, I suspect, will wind up trying to pursue multiple points of entry to these uh, types of content. So 
supporting catalog discovery, uh, having a standalone web interface, and then mobile interface as well for uh, supporting the access and discovery of that content. And if we can do a good job with how we catalog information, how we describe information, uh, that will be a repurposing of information and not having to support entirely different or distinct workflows. But the truth is, for now, the integration of mobile and web is difficult. And so, you know, it's a point of, of much research. Um, I also mentioned um, linking, linking the authentication states, uh, which is often web-based, right? If you are asked to authenticate to a campus-provided resource or, or um, gatewayed resource, you're, you are using a web-based uh, SAML or CAS login procedure at some level. Even if it's on a mobile, you're utilizing a web-driven experience. And integrating the authentication state um, and that's originating in a web environment into a mobile environment also has certain challenges, which I leave to James and his good colleagues to solve for us, mostly. Um, and that's all I have. I did mention outreach and training, and uh, we aren't there yet, uh, just beginning to think about it, and we will be leaning heavily on our colleagues at NYU and Columbia for lessons learned. And with that, I will hand it back to my colleague. Thanks, Thanks Peter. Peter. Sure. Sorry. Right. So, hopefully you're not scared off from doing this, I think as uh, Peter rightly uh, laid out for you. Ebooks are just horrifically complex, but when you step back from it and we look at the World Wide Web, is it really that hard to take a digital piece of material and distribute that at large. The web does it to millions of documents every day. So what is it about ebooks that have made this kind of a challenge, and especially for libraries? So we tried to kind of take a step back, and a lot of what I'm gonna to present to is, was also we presented it recently at Code for Lib, and it was done by some great research about the standards that kind of underlie all of this uh, metadata management and the development of the open web uh, by Ben Armitter at Columbia University. So when we looked at these standards, we kind of came back to the very standard uh, that we were using already called Open Publication Distribution System, or OPDS is the acronym we use. So when it comes to doing any type of web integration for digital content, you gotta go with web services. And so there's really two paths we could take, path one, which is actually kind of two paths because the industry was not sure which one it wanted to take, so they took both. Uh, there were web services done in XML, lightweight web services, clients, uh, syndication type feeds like Atom RSS, and their, uh, the first draft of OPDS. And then you had more of your enterprise B2B web services, XML, SOAP, and Onyx. So you, know, you saw one of those standards and you saw what I think the publication industry ended up on with Onyx. There was uh, Path 2, which is white, uh, lightweight web client services based around JSON. And so uh, what was happening in that was the definition and the use of uh, JSON was coming on and then the Redium uh, uh, Foundation, which is a group that tries to build uh, reference technologies for the development of eBooks and the uh, use of eBooks for the industry writ large, uh, was developing on that standard and arriving at what they called the Redium Web Publication Manifest. Think of it as a TOC for the web for what constitutes a book. Again, post Onyx publishing, what did that leave uh, libraries to deal with? Well, they had file management. They got to deal with open URLs, which was great. We could link to resources, but then we needed to track and report back to publishers what that, what that usage was within our systems. And how did we communicate the, our holdings and information in that? Well, we had you know, the thing that's been around since before Christ, which was the CSV file. And so what that means is it's literally human management of metadata versus machine management of metadata to get materials from the, what is defined by the publisher as describing what it is into your cataloging systems, your systems that do ILL, your systems that do authentication into platforms, your systems that do discovery uh, that may not be your uh, cataloging system. 
And so there was a University, uh, United Kingdom uh, serials group that did a report on this to kind of see where things were going and how that could be improved. And they arrived at a standard called KBART, which would allow you to, you know, basically get a report from your publishers what, or your platform providers what uh, the different resource links would be available, the identifiers that it may be referenced by so that you could try to reconcile some of this. But again, instead of a CSV, we, we went to a different level. It's a tab separated file. So you get to manage that one on top of the other three. So what I call that is kind of the, the challenge of out of band processes. And the report also had, and, and Ben found this, was uh, they kind of quietly identified the problem with that approach is that there wasn't a way that a subscription agent could take part in this process. In short, that's just a, a convoluted way of saying, wouldn't it be great if the publisher could syndicate that data and you could just subscribe to it with your web services as opposed to handing files around uh, via email boxes or FTP sites and trying to upload them into different systems. Let the machines take that information, subscribe to it, update themselves. So um, how did the, all of this affect our library partners? As uh, Peter pointed out in, in their research, we're looking at all the different workflows that apply to this. Uh, Columbia University uh, showed me their process for managing it. Uh, he stopped at number 50 uh, for each place they acquire content. That meant 50 different workflows that they have to manage just to record materials that they've acquired into their cataloging systems. All bespoke, all different, all manual. Um, and that's just to get discovery. This doesn't even approach the, uh, the, the level of what we actually need, which is access to the material. That's just getting it from purchasing <laughs> into cataloging. You go through another group, enterprise IT, when you want to talk to uh, platform access. Um, so part of this, we said, well, we need to work on some of these open standards that actually do address this, that does bring the subscription agent into the play, and OPS does do that. So how can we take that standard and, and uh, engage with the community, get the drafts moving, and get it codified so that people and platform providers have a reference standard that they can use to guide their uh, implementation uh, of, of these, this better interoperability of content from the publisher to the aggregator down to the actual user. And so the things that we're trying to codify in there is around author authorization mechanisms, acknowledging the use of SAML, SAML wafelift URLs. These are prevalent in the university set, so let's just make them part in the reference to the standard so that the standard supports that. Uh, replace out-of-band vendor knowledge, all of that file management I uh, alluded to earlier, um, to take the, uh, the minimum set of data and be able to communicate that all the way through in band to the uh, user so that you're, you don't have to have humans in between there trying to manipulate data, tr extraction, transport, load processes just to get discovery, let alone access. And then uh, offer some other mechanisms where web developers aren't really versed in SAML or these other type of uh, authentication mechanisms that are prevalent in libraries. And you use some of the things they're doing every day on the web, like uh, token-based transaction uh, protection. So what we're discovering, current tools, Adam and Kpart, you know, even in their application of this new kind of paradigm that we're imagining uh, with a built around OPDS, there's this uh, kind of a challenge of uh, expressing deletions in a syndication. So when does something actually get removed from a catalog that you have subscribed to? This is a difficult process manually. It's also in a machine learning standpoint. There's a, or a machine, machine interface, also a challenge that we need to come up with a solution. And we're working on that as part of the draft too. Uh, Authorization me uh, mechanisms may be difficult to, uh, to communicate in Atom or KBART because they're just not part of it. Um, neither along with deletions not being a part of those specs. And even what is that minimum baseline of metadata that is required actually you know, from a publisher to actually be relevant, uh, not only just for access and discovery in a mobile app or a cont uh, context, but for the library itself. Um, and you know those these uh, previous tools like KBART and Atom are just are difficult to syndicate. So uh, the current processes we also uh, discovered, as I mentioned, out of band uh, file complexity. Um, and again, I, I want to really highlight that bottom piece about platform access doesn't necessarily mean resource access. So you've gotten the material into catalog, but then there's another work ticket put into enterprise IT that says, hey, connect up to ProQuest, or hey, connect up to this vendor. 
great, you now can go onto their website and log in or they get redirected to your login. Doesn't mean you're gonna get access to the book that you found on their platform, if you find that platform in their holdings that you have. Because it may be governed or it may not be actually included for the download terms or the rights that you have. So it's, it's a misnomer to say, hey, we've integrated, we have SAML with the platform. Doesn't mean you have actual, you can actually get that book all the way down to your user. And I think Peter alluded to this in that sometimes you will land on a nice resource web page, but you're not gonna get any access to the material itself. So we believe there is a solution already in place and in practice, and we think it's JSON, uh, o the OPS2 version built around JSON. Why? Well, it's native to the modern web. Everyone's building web access platforms using JSON. It's like the go-to tool for describing data by web developers. These other things that are built around XAML or even these enterprise interfaces, developers and engineers are not that familiar with them. They're very heavyweight, they're complex. There's a lot of technical overhead to just understand and try to implement them, and they're brittle when they break. Um, OPDS can actually make that a lot simpler and it's uh, flexible enough to express uh, your catalog, discovery, and all these other type of things that you want to do. And there's a means to do syndication. It can be easily automated into workflows. And so as you look at all those manual processes and this ongoing effort to try to automate all of that, JSON is a, a nice tool for doing that because people can understand it, they can write to it, and they can uh, connect in. Um, and then the other nice piece of it, it's loosely coupling systems. It's not a tight integration. It's just providing context and guidance to the paradigm of communicating what your digital holdings are and how to access them via this uh, web standards. And it's very different prospect to doing a transaction by transaction API based uh, type of integration. So we are doing publisher engagement in this process and we have actually several folks that we're working with that already uh, looking at the standard because it, it gives them guidance because otherwise they would have to invent something themselves, create a whole new API infrastructure, build more enterprise apps, but if there's a, a guidance in an architecture and a context they can reference and it's using something that is native to what their engineers would be using, it's a good fit and we're getting some success and traction in our both our conversations and the actual implementation of the of this specification by these partners even when it's not even in full draft form out. So as we codify it and draft, we, we feel that will bring in more people. The model is really uh, simple. It, it's consistent, right? You have metadata and links, metadata and links. But what's interesting is the context goes from all the way down to describing the resources within a book to the resources that make up a, a collection and the collections that make up a catalog. But the model is pretty consistent between all of them with only the nuances changing around licenses or what other type of resource links you may have in there. So as you go to your uh, talk to your enterprise engineering or your software developers and your systems trying to automate processes, they will find themselves in a lot of this. Publishers can find their workflows and their needs for metadata in these, uh, in these models of this uh, protocol. So in summary, what we want to help evolve is the practice through standards collaboration first, not just say, hey, build to our API, and then uh, kind of move things from out of band, from platform access to resource access, out of band metadata workflows to in band syndication, fragmented identifiers, because we all call it something different, and then identifier standards, and then get rid of the ETL process and move that into consumable JSON web services. So that's kind of it, and I think our call to action is, hey, OPDS is not about building to Palace or building to our APIs. It's really about sharing a common context of implementing web services to one another to uh, improve interoperability and set a sustainability for metadata exchange. Join us. We're open. It's all on GitHub if you, you have engineers or yourself are uh, curious about it. Um, and I gotta, I've, I'm getting the, the time uh, note there. It's 10.39, so I'm going to end it there. So we can, uh, I think we have still time for questions. Uh, over, but it's okay. So we can take a, a couple of questions. If, if people are interested. Uh, all right. Well, if there are no questions, we'll be around for the rest of the, uh, the day if you have any. Uh, and some of our partners are here. Uh, that we're presenting, and you can always just see what their experiences are. Ah, great, one.
Yeah, I mean, for, for us, I, I think us together, this is part of what James was alluding to at the, towards the end of the talk, but I, I think if we can move to a place where publishers and consumers of published information, whatever, whatever that happens to be, and not just ebooks. I mean, this is really the longer term strategic vision, right? But any, any form of content uh, can move to an environment where we can exchange information about, about availability and whatever policy terms affect that availability through lightweight web-based standards, we'll be able to build a wider range of systems to support the users and the researchers that are our community. And I think, importantly for publishers, the ability to automate workflows uh, in, in a way that ensures far greater interoperability than we see today uh, without as, nearly as much hand touch would be greatly facilitated. So I, you know, I think we share this vision that utilizing lightweight standards like OPDS, uh, if we can keep them flexible and fairly clean, enables a wide range of dialogues that are difficult to have now uh, and ensures a, a more rapid exchange of information. So that's the longer term strategic vision. We feel like the, the current state is, oh, we feel like the current state of play right now in the industry is, is not sustainable. And even as we you know, explore these new tech, technologies like AI and how does that in, incorporate into scholarship, we're struggling just to maintain file distribution, which is what the web does every day because it's kind of been left to individual players in the supply chain to come up with a standard and a system and then it stops at their, at their door. Uh, then it's handed over to libraries and you're left with uh, giving it to a person to try to figure out. And they figure that out with spreadsheets and different type of file formats and processes that you are then left to invest millions of dollars in to try to tie that all between your systems. We don't feel that as a sustainable and scalable approach in the industry. So long-term strategic vision is that we can provide some guidance to help get web services adopted into that, address that uh, workflow, those needs, and get back to the business of uh, scholarship, uh, advancing human knowledge, acquiring great collections that our researchers can rely on, as opposed to just managing the logistics of ebooks, which is just really terrible <laughs> right now. But any other questions? Yeah. Yeah. I think, that, I think that's very close to it because there's not a winner-take-all situation in where there's one central platform. This is about platforms being able to interoperate because the reality of business agreements and business preference is that certain content that they own governance to, uh, they're going to keep on their systems. But if they can facilitate the larger industry being able to access it within those terms, then we can have a distributed system, much like the World Wide Web is today. If no one understood HTTP, HML, or JavaScript, any of that, and we didn't have browsers, we wouldn't have a World Wide Web. So we just need some fundamentals there so that we can go forward. Right, that's it. Oh, one more? Yeah, I'm just wondering, um, in your discussions with publishers, are they seeing the same thing, that their model is unsustainable? I mean, we know that they've built these really complex, difficult-to-use systems because they think that they're pr protecting their intellectual property from piracy or being too easily distributed. So, I mean, are they actually coming around to what, what you're doing, or are they be being very resistant to it? No, short answer is yes. So they are, uh, there's something that they can see themselves in that answers their business uh, needs, so they're okay with it. We gotta go, we're getting a hand wave. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, guys.